What kind of luck did a brilliant scientist like Michael Faraday need to succeed in life? Well, it turns out quite a lot. Fortunately, he did have a lot of luck. From a supportive boss, a good book, a generous patron, a chemical explosion, a fist fight, and a fortunate outbreak of the plague. Wait a minute, those last three don't sound fortunate at all. Well, they were fortunate for Faraday, and I'll explain in the video. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. Michael Faraday seemed an unusual person to change the world. He was born in 1791 to a mostly out-of-work blacksmith in the slums of London. His rudimentary education was cut particularly short as his mother took him out of school after just a few months to keep him away from an abusive teacher. He never learned Latin or any languages other than English. And astonishingly, he also never learned mathematics, except maybe basic algebra. Also, he was born poor at a time when it was incredibly difficult for a poor person to study science. In England, there were no free libraries, and most scientific books were written in Latin and assumed the reader had a formal education. Lectures were expensive, and it was also difficult and expensive to get materials for experiments. Most lower class jobs were seven days a week and 12 hours a day. Finally, no one wanted to publish the work of an amateur scientist who didn't come from a good background. Faraday did have a few advantages. First, he was white and male and Christian. Second, he was brilliant and organized. And third, he was very lucky, repeatedly. His luck began when he was 13 years old and he got a job delivering books for a nice bookseller named George Rabat. He said that Faraday spent all his free time, quote, searching for some mineral or vegetable curiosity, his mind ever engaged. Rabal gave Faraday a lot of free time to experiment and to go to lectures. He also gave him space in the back of the bookshop to conduct experiments. Most importantly, he let his young employee read any book that floated through the bookshop. Years later, Faraday credited two books for inspiring him to go into science. The first book was an old edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which had 127 pages on the latest developments in electricity. The second was a book called Conversations in Chemistry. A bit of background on the chemistry book. At the time, the most famous science speaker was a man named Humphrey Davy. Davy gave hugely popular poetic and dazzling talks for the upper crust on chemistry at the Royal Institution. A wealthy woman named Jane Marset went to a talk and found it confusing. When she asked around, she found she wasn't alone. Most people were confused, especially the women who had no science background. After she asked her husband to explain it to her, she found the lectures to be far more interesting. For this reason, she wrote a simple introduction to chemistry, quote, especially for the female sex. Now this was an extremely sexist time, but there are no other books that explain chemistry on a simple level, so it became a bestseller. Years later, Faraday said that, quote, I felt like I had got hold of an anchor in chemical knowledge and clung fast to it. Thence my deep veneration for Mrs. Marset. In February of 1810, Faraday borrowed a shilling from his older brother and went to his first science lecture. Faraday took copious notes, added his thoughts and experiments, and created a book of his own. He dedicated the book to his kind boss, Rubau. Quote, to you is to be attributed the rise and existence of that small portion of knowledge related to the sciences which I possess. Meanwhile, Humphrey Davy, the man whose talks inspired Jane Marset to write a chemistry book, was becoming more and more admired. In 1812, he was made a baron and married a rich socialite. Now that Davy was Sir Humphrey Davy with a demanding social life and wife, he decided he would curtail giving so many talks. Therefore, he put together a series of four final talks. Tickets to these talks were ridiculously difficult to come by. Luckily for Faraday, a man named Mr. Dance had seen Faraday's book on chemistry and decided to give the young man an incredible gift, tickets to all four of Davy's final talks. As you might expect, 
Faraday was entranced by the talks. It took him about five months afterwards to collect enough money to recreate Davy's experiments creating gases with a homemade battery. He wrote to a friend about his adventures, quote, I, sir, I, my own self, cut out seven discs of zinc of the size of half pennies each. I, sir, covered them with seven half pence, and I interposed between them paper soaked in salt water. Faraday then placed the ends of the battery in a solution of salts and noted that, quote, both the wires became covered in a short time with bubbles of some gas. Just as with the previous lectures, Faraday created a book of his notes from Davy's talks interspersed with his own experiments and observations. Faraday wrote a pleading letter to the president of the Royal Institute for a job, but never got a reply, even to reject him. In October of 1812, Faraday finished his apprenticeship. Unable to get a job in science, he got a job with another bookseller. This new boss had no interest in furthering Faraday's scientific interests. He was not allowed to do ad hoc experiments in the back of the room. He was not allowed to peruse the books. He was not even allowed to take Wednesdays off to go to talks. Faraday morosely wrote a friend that, quote, with respect to the progress of the sciences, I know but little, and I'm now likely to know still less. I must resign science entirely to those who are more fortunate in possession of time and means. Luckily for Faraday, Humphrey Davy heard his eye in a chemical explosion and needed an assistant. His friend, Mr. Dance, the same one who got Faraday the tickets, got Faraday his dream job of assisting his idol for a few days. When he was done, Faraday sent a letter to Davy asking for a permanent job, along with his precious book of notes and experiments. Davy responded with a short note of encouragement that Faraday kept until his death, but then added he didn't need any help at that time. Once again, Faraday had a spot of luck as one of Davy's assistants got in a fight with an instrument maker and was fired. Finally, Faraday was working in science. Woo! Faraday quickly proved to be an able assistant and Davy began to rely on him more and more. The following year, Davy became so famous that he and his wife were given special passports by Napoleon to travel to Europe, even though there was a 20 year long war between England and France. When Davy's personal valet refused to visit the enemy, Davy asked Faraday to join them as an assistant and temporary valet. Faraday was nervous about the trip. He'd never been outside of London, and he also had a bit of a distaste for being a servant, but he decided to join in on the adventure. Through Davy, Faraday met all of the important scientists of France and Italy, and it was said that, quote, we admired Davy, but we love Faraday. Faraday found his time with Davy to be endlessly educational. Quote, the constant presence of Sir Humphrey Davy was a mine inexhaustible of knowledge and improvement. Although Faraday got along very well with Davy, the same cannot be said of Davy's wife, Jane. Jane Davy was from the upper crust of society and did not like associating with someone from a poor background like Faraday. Faraday complained that Jane Davy, quote, delights in making her inferiors feel her power. Once, when they were on a perilous sea voyage in the Gulf of Genoa, Mrs. Davy became too ill to speak. Faraday wrote to a friend that it was worth the danger to their lives just to enjoy her silence. Their relationship hit its lowest point when the boat landed and they were invited to dinner with Mrs. Jane Marset and her husband. This was the same Jane Marset who wrote the Conversations in Chemistry that inspired Faraday in the first place. At the dinner, Davy's wife, in front of the assembled guest, told Faraday that he should eat dinner in the kitchen with the other servants. After dinner, Jane Marset's husband tried to fix this injustice by announcing loudly, quote, and now my dear sirs, let us go and join Mr. Faraday in the kitchen. Things were reaching a breaking point for Faraday. He wrote a friend, quote, alas, how foolish was I to leave home, to leave those whom I loved and who loved me. Who knows what would have happened if they hadn't heard there was an outbreak of plague on their next stops, Greece and Turkey. 
Reluctantly, Humphrey Davy decided to cut their trip short and return home. See? Lucky plague. Back in England, Faraday was promoted to semi-independent researcher, although he continued to help Davy for the next six years. In 1821, Faraday was asked to write a report on the latest development in electricity. As was his way, he read all of the experiments he could find and recreated them, including a very strange experiment conducted in Denmark, where a current and a wire moved a compass needle in a most unusual way. This experiment that proved that electricity affected magnetism was to transform Faraday's life and the world. And that story is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a nice thumbs up. Also, if you haven't watched the previous video about Davy and laughing gas, it's a great story. I think you should check it out. And also check out the next one about Orsted and his experiments with current and a wire and magnets. Really interesting. Okay, thanks a lot. Remember to join my YouTube page, Kathy Loves Physics, my Facebook page, Kathy Loves Physics, or check out my webpage, www.kathylovesphysics.com. Okay, have a nice day.